Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. My name is Lena Wen, and I'm the 4-H Extension Agent for Fauquier County. The purpose of this program is to highlight Virginia-grown produce and livestock that are raised on farms across the Commonwealth and demonstrate how to create a delicious and nutritious meal with a highlighted ingredient. This educational program will highlight Virginia agriculture, community nutrition, and farm-to-table connections, and is brought to you by Virginia Cooperative Extension. VCE is an educational outreach program of Virginia's land-grant universities, Virginia Tech, and Virginia State University. Um, VCE's educational programs are delivered through a network of faculty at these two universities, 108 county and city offices, 11 agricultural research and extension centers, and six 4-H educational centers. I encourage you all to participate in your local VCE programs to learn more if you have not already. And today's session is going to be focusing on chicken. We're going to start with a virtual tour of Restoration Acres. Um, Rachel Palma will be sharing information with us about how they raise past, um, pastured poultry um, at Restoration Acres. And then Dr. Mike Persia from Virginia Tech's Department of Animal and Poultry Sciences will share an overview of the broiler industry in Virginia. And then we're going to hear from Jefferson Heatwall from Shenandoah Valley Organics about their Farmer Focus brand. And, a little bit about how organic chicken is raised. And finally, Janelle Smith, who's a senior family nutrition program assistant from Lynchburg, she's going to teach us how to cook chicken in a crock pot and make bone broth. Um, Tiffany Patrick is one of our VCE summer interns and she's going to serve today as a Q&A monitor. So if you have any questions that you would like the presenters to answer, you can go ahead and type those into the Q&A box and we'll try to address as many of those as possible at the end of the session. So these are our presenters today and I'm going to pass it over to Rachel from Restoration Acres. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Rachel. My husband, Matt, and I are, we are farming in Big Island, Virginia, Bedford County. Uh, we've been farming since 2013. Uh, our first batch of poultry that we raised was 25 birds. And we have gone up this year, we'll be doing 4,500. So we've, we've increased a little bit each year. Um, we also raise pastured uh, pigs and some sheep, turkeys, um, but the poultry and the pigs are biggest enterprises. Um, so this is just a little video of our brooder. Uh, when we first get our chicks, we actually get them in the mail. Um, they come in boxes with holes in them and we get them when they're about two days old. And we have a brooder that we put them in, which is just the building that's, we actually have ours insulated so that we can brood in the winter if needed. Um, and it keeps the chicks nice and warm. They like, they, like, sorry, they like 98 degrees for the first few days. And then we slowly uh, let it go down cooler as, as they get their feathers in. Um, when they're two weeks old, we put them out into our uh, pastured pens, which you will see in the next video. So these are just the little guys. These are a couple days old, um, enjoying the heat lamp and they have fresh food and water and then we use pine shavings um, we keep fresh bedding in there keep it nice and clean and little tough balls <laughs> so we get about we get them in batches of about 800 at a time 800 chickens at a time We don't have any in the brooder right now, so this is actually a video from a few months ago. We've got turkeys in the brooder. All right, so here's another uh, a video of our chicken pen. So uh, I recorded this a couple days ago, so we'll go ahead and play it, um, and I'll explain what we do Hi, with the pen. this is Rachel with Restoration Acres Farm. I'm going to uh, give you a little snapshot of what we do here with our pastured chicken. Uh, here are our chicken pens. Wanted to give you a view from far away so you can see what they look like. They're all lined up. We have currently have 10 of them going. And I'll get a little bit closer to show you exactly what we do with them. 
So here's a close-up of one of our chicken pens or chicken shelters or chicken tractors, all kinds of different names for them. But basically it's just a structure that's mobile that we have out right on the grass that the chickens live in. You can see some in here now. These guys are about uh, four weeks old. Drinking from water there. Um, these pens are 10 feet by 12 feet uh, by 2 feet high and we put 70 to 80 birds in them at a time. Gives them plenty of room as you can see they're all in the shade right now. Um, but they have the option to come out and sunbathe. They have their feet in there, they have fresh water. Um, protection from the elements, um, rain, wind, sunshine. They have protection on the back as you can see on part of the sides. These structures get moved every day. So um, I'll show you what our dolly looks like over here. This is a dolly. Uh, we have another video that will show you of Matt uh, in the process of moving a, the chicken pen so you can see how it works. But basically that dolly goes underneath the one side and the pen sits on it and the wheels are on the ground and then we go around to the other side of the pen and pull it just one pen length so that gives them a completely fresh 10 by 12 piece of grass uh, or piece of pasture rather that they can enjoy for the day they eat a lot of a lot of grass um, and we've got 10 of them so it only takes maybe one one person maybe 30 minutes uh, max to move them all, feed them all, and water them all every day, every morning. <clears throat> and then in the evenings we come back, fill their waters, top off their feed. So you're looking at less than an hour a day. You take care of 10 chicken pens, it's 800 chickens at a time, because there's about 80 in each pen. Here's a better view on the inside. All the birdies enjoying the shade on this very hot day. They're actually very active grazers. They eat a lot of grass. And then they also have a, a non-GMO grain ration that we get from a local mill that they enjoy. So there are several reasons that we raise the birds this way, um, as opposed to having them in a stationary environment or an indoor environment. Um, we love to have animals in their, uh, as you would say, natural habitat, where you would see them in nature, you know, outside <laughs> on grass. Animals are always moving. If you look at animals um, in the wild, they are never stationary. They never stay in one spot for too long. Um, one reason is for food, because they'll eat all the food and then they have to go find more food. Another reason is predation, and there's predators that go after them, so if they stay in one place, they're an easy target, so they're always moving. So at our farm, that is our basic, one of our core values is, is that we are always moving our animals. We don't have any stationary animals. Um, but moving them gives them the fresh pasture every day, so they get lots of green grass, lots of bugs, grubs, all kinds of stuff. It also moves them away from their manure, so we do not have an issue with parasites. Um, they are never on the same patch of land for too long to where parasites become an issue so we don't have to use any kind of worming or any antibiotics because their chickens don't get sick it's really a great system it seem it is it is labor intensive but like I said before you're looking at an hour a day to take care of 800 chickens um, and it really benefits the land because these birds their manure is going directly onto the grass, which builds soil, keeps the soil life healthy, lots of good nitrogen. Um, 
the 80 birds per pen and that size for one day is a really good amount of manure. If it's more than that, can burn out the grass. If it's less than that, you know, I mean, it's not bad. It's just that you can, you can get even better results as far as pasture improvements with that amount of birds per day. So this is a big field that we have them in. They started all the way at their end and have moved their way. You see this lush green grass from where they were. And then we turned them and they are now making their way back that way. When we can, when we do have the cows or sheep in this area, we do, we have the herbivores graze the field ahead of the pen so that the grass is nice and short, but if the herbivores are in another part of the farm when we need them, we just use a bush hog. The chickens prefer the shorter grass, so, and it's also hard to move these pens if the grass is too tall. That is the basic gist of what we do here at Restoration Acres Farm with our pastured poultry. Um, we have uh, an on-farm processing area that we do all the processing ourselves um, on another part of the farm. So we harvest them here and sell direct to consumers, so farmers markets and drop-off points in town. And it's really a great system. All right, well, that was the, uh, our system. And now we have another short video just to show you how exactly Matt moves the pens every morning. Uh, so you can go ahead and play that. Uh, he lifts the pen up a couple times to kind of notify the chickens that he's about to move them. It only takes them maybe two moves to learn the gist. Uh, and so he slides the the dolly under there walks around our dog banjo there actually does help sometimes <laughs> helps chase the chickens through if they're if they're not moving but as you can see these are older birds and they're just moving right along they walk and he pulls it until it's all into fresh grass and they're uh we make the pens heavy enough to where the wind doesn't you know take them away but light enough to where somebody can move them so um they're pretty pretty light and then he just pulls the dolly right out and that's it. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, well, I think one of the things that, that I want to talk about first is I really appreciate the diversity of agriculture within uh, Virginia. Uh, I mean, you can see uh, from the previous presentation that we have uh, a small producer here uh, doing a great job uh, and, and really promoting agriculture. Um, but when I talk about the diversity of our agriculture within Virginia, uh, we also have a very large and thriving uh, broiler industry uh, at a much larger scale as well. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, uh, just to get into that. <clears throat> um, so when I talk about chickens, you know, certainly we have, we have small farmers and, and actually with uh, backyard birds, we have birds throughout the entire state of Virginia. Uh, but when we talk about the broiler industry, uh, what we're talking about is it's sort of concentrated in, in three major areas, sort of around the, the Augusta, Rockingham County, Harrisonburg area uh, is, is probably the largest uh, poultry area in, in the state. Uh, there's also some birds uh, outside of Richmond and then uh, also birds out on the eastern shore. Um, and when I talk about the, the broiler industry, what I'm talking about here is really an integrated system. Uh, and in that integrated system, there are large companies that are involved, but there's also independent farmers that are involved as well. Um, and within the state of Virginia, uh, the large companies uh, will actually supply the birds. Uh, they, they will either supply them uh, from their own hatcheries or they will, will contract with other hatcheries to bring them in. Uh, and they supply the feed as well. Uh, th those birds and that feed will go to the independent farmer and that independent farmer supplies uh, the, the facility where the birds are raised and they, they supply the, the labor and the care uh, to raise those birds. Uh, when the birds were raised, then at that point, the integrated company uh, will come in, they will collect those birds up and take them to the processing plant to turn them into the food that we eat. Um, so it's actually a very nice system. 
Uh, and I was actually on a call. Uh, it wasn't in Virginia. It was actually uh, a call in, in uh, dealing with the state of Kentucky. Uh, and, and one of their state officials actually said uh, they had, uh, they are currently sort of transitioning from uh, sort of a post-tobacco uh, agriculture. Uh, and they said one of, the, one of the things that they really appreciated about the broiler industry is it allowed a lot of young farmers to actually get involved because uh, they, they were able, with the, with the backing of the integrated broiler company, uh, they were actually able to qualify uh, for the loans uh, to start farming. They said in the, in the past six months, I believe they had 10 farmers uh, between the age of, of 25 and 40 that had actually qualified for loans and, and started uh, broiler production uh, in Kentucky. So I think that's one of the, one of the nice uh, stories that we can capture out of this relationship is it does allow for young people to get back into uh, agriculture and on the farm. Within uh, Within Virginia, uh, broilers actually ranks number one as far as cash receipts. Uh, and this is, uh, the latest data we have is actually 2008. Uh, and it's a, a little bit under a uh, billion dollars. Uh, and that is actually 26% uh, or a little bit over 26% uh, of the total agricultural cash receipts uh, in the state. Uh, so, and I talked earlier about the integrated system uh, basically, those broilers, uh, you, you've got larger companies, but they work with over 800 independent farmers. Uh, so it is a nice system where, where not only uh, do you support uh, the large companies, but it also supports a lot of independent farmers uh, and really brings a nice, uh, a, a nice, <coughs> excuse me, uh, a, a nice division of labor uh, and, and risk uh, to this enterprise. So, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit also about how Virginia ranks within the United States as far as broiler production. Uh, we, Virginia actually currently is top 10. Uh, they come in uh, number 10. Uh, Georgia is number one, followed by Alabama and Arkansas. Uh, so as you can see, a lot of the broiler industry is uh, located across the southeast, and Virginia uh, touches sort of the top part of that southeastern uh, area. So uh, certainly uh, uh, not on the scale as we see in, in some of the, in Georgia or, or Alabama, or, uh, but certainly large business here as well. So what, do, what does the, the poultry industry mean to Virginia? Uh, and again, these are our data coming from, from uh, 2008, and this was actually put together uh, by a, a group that uh, relied on some modeling. Uh, so th this is modeled as, as to what really the poultry industry means to the state of Virginia. Uh, and the poultry industry directly employs, uh, they estimated as many as uh, 18,000 employees. Uh, and when we start talking about ancillary and supplier jobs, that number is actually multiplied out to almost 35,000. Uh, it supports the, the livelihood of nearly 11,000 farm families. Uh, and, and this is, uh, and I apologize, I should have noted this up front. This is not broken out uh, by broiler or turkey. This actually combines both of them and egg layers as well. So that's why when I say the over 800, that's the broiler number. And then uh, the, the additional 300 there come from, from the turkeys. So if we look at direct wages provided by the broiler industry, uh, over 600 million direct wages. Uh, and then when we uh, look at the ancillary and supplier jobs uh, and indirect, uh, that would go up to, to 2.6 trillion uh, uh, in, uh, sorry, million, uh, billion in, in, uh, in wages. So when we look at the direct economic impact, uh, that is uh, 5 billion, over 5 billion. Uh, and when we look at uh, overall uh, economic activity within the Commonwealth, uh, including the ancillary and supplier jobs, we're looking at over 12, 12.5 billion. Uh, so very, very large business, very large numbers, and, and vitally important for uh, those areas of Virginia, uh, especially the rural areas of Virginia, where the, where the poultry industry is located. So in my last slide here, I just wanna talk a little bit uh, about some of the efficiencies uh, that have gone on over the years 
uh, and why uh, poultry has become uh, the, the number one sold meat uh, based off of efficiency and, and desire. So if we look here in 1929, it took uh, over 100 days to raise a bird to two and a half pounds. Uh, if we look in 2019, uh, and those are the latest data that we have, uh, it's taking 47 days. That bird, instead of being two and a half pounds, is now over six pounds. Um, and really the numbers that I want you guys to focus on, hopefully you can see my, my uh, mouse here, uh, is this uh, feed to meat gain, uh, 4.7 uh, in 1925. So that means that that bird consumed 4.7 pounds of feed to produce one pound of live weight gain. That number has come down to 1.8. So we are less than two pounds of feed to produce that one pound of gain. Uh, and I just uh, calculated out some numbers. So uh, Virginia currently produces uh, 281 million uh, birds a year. If we were to go back to 1925, uh, we would actually have to raise over 700 million birds. Um, and we would actually use about uh, two and a half times the amount of feed. Uh, and again, two and a half times the amount of water. Uh, so I just want to highlight here uh, the, the efficiency gains that have come through genetics, through nutrition, and through management uh, that allows us to have uh, both an economical and a high quality product here. Um, and I think this is important to remember when we start talking about, uh, you know, the, the efficiency that we need and the technology that we need to utilize uh, to grow these birds, uh, not only from a, a profit standpoint, but also from an environmental standpoint. Because uh, if you look at, at the, the million tons of feed here that would be required, um, it, that's a significant amount of land that we actually no longer have uh, to produce these birds. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I think my time's up and, and thank everyone and I'll pass it on to the next person. Well, thanks, doc Doctor. Um, my name is Jefferson with uh, SVO. I uh, hope everybody's having a good Friday. Um, we're gonna explain a little bit about um, who Shenandoah Valley Organic is as a company, how we uh, got founded and, and what we're doing. Uh, my cousin and I, um, Grew up in the Shenandoah Valley uh, in a farming community and um, as you just heard the, the Shenandoah Valley specifically around Harrisonburg is uh, uh, an agriculture centric area. I believe there's over for a thousand chicken houses within an hour of Harrisonburg uh, alone and one of the things that has um, changed over especially the last 50 years is the amount of places that a chicken farmer would have the option to take their birds to market uh, kept consolidating as the industry got bigger. Thank you. So um, as a result of this and, and realizing that the farmers needed more options, uh, our vision and mission is really around promoting and protecting generational family farms. So we wanted to make sure that we gave the, um, the farmers themselves, the ones that were uh, putting themselves at risk and putting their, you know, hard sweat equity into, uh, into raising food for the local community and abroad, and be able to give them an option that was different than what they had, please. So, to sum it up, the, the valley was full of a, a substantial amount of, of farming individuals. Many of them had um, farms and, and chicken houses that had been in their families for generations. And um, because they may not have the, the newest technology, cooling cells, LED lights, et cetera, um, but they had good structures, uh, they found themselves at, an, at, a, at a disadvantage for uh, where the, the commodity industry was going. And so we focused on an all organic model, which we'll speak about a little bit more, but um, just to briefly sum that up, there's no antibiotics, uh, herbicides or pesticides in the feed um, they're not also, the, the, there's an outside access area that weather permitting the uh, chickens have the option to go to, and there's no spray around that area either. And another key thing that allowed us to utilize these, these uh, older uh, chicken houses, if you will, is that we use relaxed density. Um, so it takes um, about the same amount of time 
to raise a chicken uh, as compared to conventional. It, it um, really is dependent though on having less birds in those houses. Uh, they live a very active lifestyle. They're able to, to walk freely. We have um, within the, the organic standards as well, we, we also are double humane certified. So there are um, perches and uh, what we like to call um, enrichments uh, which are, are structures that both can give shade from the outside, allow the chickens to perch and, and climb and live a, a more, more natural life cycle. And so what we're able to do as well, since um, we operate out of Harrisonburg, Virginia, we're actually using uh, what was an abandoned turkey plant, um, retrofitted that and started operating in 2014. And the, the model works with, again, existing farmers, but um, as opposed to most of the commodity industry, uh, the chickens actually contractually own their own flocks. So we do um, negotiate organic feed and, and uh, chicks for all of our farmers. We work with them to do that. We're transparent with the pricing, but they're actually investing in, in the sourcing of those items. And then we buy the birds back at a, at a premium, a 45 to 50% premium actually, uh, which rewards the farmers for their hard work and, and investment in this system. And that allows us then to um, take the birds at, its, at the time that it's go to market and process them uh, here in our plant in Harrisonburg. Um, there you will see our, on this slide, our brand, which is called Farmer Focus. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we put the focus on the farmer, <laughs> not to be tongue in cheek about it, but put the focus really on, on the people that were doing the work and upholding their standards. So all of our chicken is uh, certified organic and also certified. It's also uh, traceable back to the specific farm that um, that chicken came from. So one of the things here that we wanted to do is, as people um, were asking us before we uh, started producing a retail brand, said, you know, how do, how do we know more about the people? How do we understand more about where this product does come from? And so as an example here, and uh, actually my friend, uh, Jason Darty, I believe we have a video coming up. Uh, the Darties uh, live just across the mountain in West Virginia, uh, great family folk. And also if, uh, <laughs> if you go to uh, farmerfocus.com and you check on the farm ID, you can just type in L-Y-L-E and you'll see uh, more information about their farm. Also, uh, <laughs> if you follow Jason on, uh, on social media, he's, he's not only hilarious, he's a car enthusiast and a passionate farmer, but he's often posting pictures of the uh, chickens as they're playing around outside or doing goofy things inside of the house. So I believe we have a video queued up. There's uh, the family. I have a lot of people ask me what makes an organic chicken organic, which is a very, very, very good question. What makes a chicken organic is a combination of diet and environment. We're going to make sure firstly that everything that they ingest is going to be completely free of pesticide or any type of antibiotic, anything that is not purely as natural as possible. The other thing is their environment. We're not gonna allow them access to areas that have been sprayed with pesticides or treated with chemicals or anything that they could either eat, drink, and just somehow, whether it's through their orally or through their skin. Part of our organic and humane standards is we're trying to bring the outside into the inside, which means we're going to put what's called enrichment, structures inside the houses. We're trying to encourage natural behavior. We want the chickens to, to perch. We want them to dig. We want them to play. Uh, we're going to build things that they can climb on top of, things that they can hide under. Anything to encourage the natural behavior of a chicken is what we're trying to do here. Our birds do have outside access. They're able to go outside once they're old enough, approximately 28 days. They can go outside if the temperatures are between 65 and 85 degrees. We let them go out, we let them play. They get sunshine. Um, vitamin D is very, very essential to, to bird growth. It's good for your mental status. We want to raise happy chickens here. Thank you, Lena, and appreciate everyone's time and look forward to staying connected out there. Thank you, Jefferson. Janelle, do you want to tell us a little bit about the video we're going to watch next? So I'm in Lynchburg and um, I am adult nutrition educator for SNAP Ed. 
but I have a passion for cooking and for food. And I'm fortunate enough to be a customer of Rachel and Matt at Restoration Acres Farm right here at our Lynchburg Community Market. And um, I am very frugal. And so I wanted to show you a simple recipe for a chicken. Uh, we eat a lot of chicken at my house. Um, my husband and my daughter both have alpha gal, so we can't eat anything that has hooves in it. I mean, I can, but I just don't keep it in the house. And so I make that chicken that I cook, at least one chicken every week. It stretches, and then I use every bit of the bones. Um, so I'm going to sh also show you how to make bone broth, which is so good for your digestive system. Um, it's loaded in collagen, which is good for your body as well. Um, and what I do is I just cook a chicken every, usually every Sunday, and then I make a few meals out of it. And then I pick all the meat off and I put the bones in a bag and it put it in the freezer. And so once a month, I pull out all those carcasses. It looks kind of like a graveyard towards the end of the month in my freezer. And along with vegetable scraps, and then I make bone broth. And I just freeze it. And I actually drink a cup of bone broth in the morning after I have my tea, then I have my bone broth. And so it's very good um, probiotics for your gut. Um, so the first video is how to simply cook a chicken in a crock pot. And then the next video will just explain how to make bone broth very simply. And I'm available for any questions you have. Thanks for having me.
Um, so the first um, question I think is for Rachel. Um, the question is, are the portable pen waterers rain water collectors and filled as needed when no rain? And also who makes these? Um, so they're not intentionally rainwater collectors, but they do collect rainwater. Uh, we actually have a, a cow trough that we have on the field with a float valve on it connected to a, a spigot. So we keep that tub filled with water and then we use buckets to just pour into the buckets that you see sitting on top of the pens. Um, the ones we have are Plasson broiler drinkers, P-L-A-S-S-O-N. Um, and my husband ordered them off of qcsupply.com. So that's where he gets them from. But they work really great. They're just gravity, you know, gravity waters. So okay. we used to use ones with the screw top, but these are so much quicker to fill. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and next question is also for you, Rachel. Are these pens left out all four seasons with broilers, or do you have a different raising process during cold weather? Uh, so we only raise broilers. We get our first batch of chicks in March, usually the second week in March. And then our last batch, we process the first week in November. So November through March, we don't have any chickens in them. So we just leave them, we line them up along the edge of the field and they just stay there empty all winter. Um, this one is for Rachel. Do you have problems with wildlife trying to get in the chicken tractors? Yeah, so we, um, we had a wonderful livestock guardian dog up until about three months ago, sadly we lost her. But when we had her, we never had an issue with predators. Um, she was wonderful, she was worth every penny. <laughs> we plan to get another one, just not quite ready for that, for training a puppy again. Um, so since, she's been gone we've we have had uh we had one issue a few weeks ago with a couple of skunks what they were doing is they were finding um a gap between the pen and the ground and just kind of reaching in there and, and trying to pull chickens out so we lost a couple of chickens my husband did take care of that but um normally we take extra pieces of wood just scrap pieces and any gaps around the pens we just stick a piece of wood there and that we hadn't done it when we were having that issue so once we started doing that again, it was not a problem. So we haven't had a big issue with predators. Some people do, but the livestock guardian dog, if you can, if you can make that work, is worth, well worth the investment. Okay, great. Um, I am not seeing any other questions. So we will go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, thank you everyone for presenting. Um, I learned a lot about different aspects of the broiler industry and different ways to raise chickens today. So hopefully um, all of you learned something new too. Uh, the link here is where you can find um, registration information for future farm to table sessions. I'll go ahead and send that out in an email too. Um, on that link, you'll also find recordings from previous um, sessions that have already. Um, but yes, thank you again to all of our presenters, and I hope you all enjoy.